Yo, and welcome to the 145th episode of Link of Rage Pokemon Trading Card Game Podcast. I'm your host, as always, Kevin Clementi, aka Mellow underscore Magikarp. I'm joined today by a very special temporary guest host joining us for, I want to say it's the third time, is that correct? I don't know. Perfect. I'm bad with numbers. Let's go ahead and say the third time we have, you've already heard the voice, you know the voice, Luke Morsa, aka Celio's Network. Luke, how are you doing today? Hey, uh, Kevin, I am, uh, I'm doing fine. You know, uh, we just had the biggest internationals ever happen amongst a rotation and a new set. And we have Orlando in like four or five days. We'll be submitting deck lists. So I think everybody's a little bit on their toes right now. Uh, you know, trying to balance work and testing and metagaming and stuff. So, uh, chances are I'm right where all the listeners are as well. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be talking about those EUIC results, both hitting into Orlando and just kind of in general, if you have any uh, local tournaments coming up, anything like that, or you're just kind of like, what is going to happen here? Because I'm going to give us a shout out. Uh, our meta discussion last week turned out to be pretty good of a call. So I want to give a, you know, Vinny and Brent and Sack and James did a pretty solid job there. But now, like like Luke said, we have another regional coming up and it's not a whole lot of time to adjust, but that doesn't mean these results aren't going to make people make some changes here. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And actually, one of the things we're going to talk about first is going to be the junior results because a deck that we weren't expecting at least i wasn't expecting luke you might have been expecting i'll let you explain why in a second but (laughs) a deck that i was not expecting won juniors and i think a deck that is currently being slept on to an extent a deck that no one is talking about but does have some positive value right now so luke why don't you go ahead and start us off because this is closer to your heart than mine yeah, um, so the Juniors Division was won by Lawson and Gudra. Um, if you did not watch the finals of the Juniors Division, um, it was Lawson and Gudra versus Lugia Archaeops, and uh, that is a pretty poor matchup, in my opinion, for mm-hmm. Lawson and Gudra. But, um, you know, you can take poor matchups to inconsistent decks sometimes because, spoiler alert, uh, Peter, who was the junior playing Lugia, bricked hard, and uh, so lost on Gudra, just kind of took away the game. Um, but yeah, so Johan, who uh, was the junior champion, uh, he's uh, a student of mine. I actually didn't do one-on-one coaching with him leading up to this event, just because of schedule problems, but he, uh, his dad and I worked on the list a lot, and um, his dad and I did all the matchup concepts and stuff like that while Johan was traveling to the event and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so Johan ended up playing Lawson Gudra. Um, Lawson Gudra, well, we, we kind of agreed that the metagame was going to look like Charizard and Lawson Box, mm-hmm. and then maybe some Stall, maybe some Pal, um, maybe some Turbo Hands. But uh, over the past, like, last few months of the last format before rotation hit, the junior division overall became very comfortable with Lost Zone Box. Um, we, I think we had seen juniors stay away from Lost Zone Box for a while, and then like there was just like a burst of juniors playing Lost Zone Box. I guess they finally got the hang of it or weren't afraid of it anymore. Um, but yeah, Lost Zone Gudra had a few things going for it into this event. One, nobody was practicing against it. I will say my my other student uh, at EUIC uh, lost to Johan on the winning into top eight. He was playing Pidgeot Control. Reason we went with that list was also people weren't practicing against it. That's like an mm-hmm. innate advantage uh, going into a big event like this when everybody's targeting, okay, I want to beat Charizard, I want to beat and Pal, I want to beat Lugia, maybe I also want to beat Snorlax Stall, but nobody's like, okay, let's practice against the 1.5% of people who are going to be playing Pidgeot Control, right? Mm-hmm. Same thing goes for Gudra. Um, it's a card that I'm sure people had to pick up and read because they hadn't seen it for like eight months, um, and it had good matchups into Lost in Box and Charizard. Um, not bad into and Pal. Uh, can hold its own against a bunch of other meta stuff, Lugia being the one real uh, bad thing, and also this deck gained Mist Energy, which mm-hmm. was a big thing for it because Gudra decks uh, in prior formats were playing Big Parasol um, to stop one hit knockout effects. Uh, so Mist Energy was a big thing for this deck as well. But yeah, a, a culmination of uh, metagame developing in a way where this deck could take advantage, uh, 
literally nobody practicing against this in their repertoire. Uh, that also does a big uh, help for you know finding success with a rogue deck when you have matchup concepts against every meta deck and those meta decks don't have matchup concepts against you you just start the game ahead like it's like imagine a chess opening that you've never seen before that's pretty much what this is like when you have your concepts ready to go and the opponent's figuring things out on the fly so um and then also johan is just an incredibly gifted player so um that also goes into that I want to add one more thing, and I know you know this, but another thing that Gudra gained from last format, if people are like, where was it? It's like, all right, Miss Energy, obviously, right, for Moon and Tina, but also the Tina matchup when they played Rope could get very sketchy because they could go Rope boss at any point, right? Now, Rope is rotated, so you have to go Prime Catcher boss to be able right. to actually or get past Belly that Bird or sure. Iron, Iron Bundle, but Tina doesn't play Iron Bundle. Uh, I did look at the juniors top eight lists on mm -hmm. Polka Data, and there was, I think, two out of three Lost Zone box, or maybe this is including Johan's Gudra list, but there was a, a couple of lists playing Iron Bundle. Um, I think Iron Bundle is becoming more commonplace in Lost Zone box now. Um, I don't think it'll become commonplace in Tina. Like, maybe if Gudra became like a tier 1.5 deck in terms of popularity, it mm -hmm. would Iron Bundle might go into Tina, but. Um, yeah, I don't expect to see that. So before we jump into the master stuff, this is something I've always been curious about, and you kind of alluded to it a little bit. How do you go about metagaming for either juniors or seniors? Because I've been asked before by like local Poke parents or some of the kids, and I'm always like, I have no freaking clue what y'all are doing down there. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, for general pop of the juniors, it's like not that far off from general pop of the masters. Like, you know, we expected kids to bring the best deck in format. We expected kids to bring the second best deck in format. So uh, from like an objective, like, okay, first week of the format looking kind of thing, I would call those two decks Zard and Pal, just because I think Zard and Pal have the highest power level um, overall, like power level that they can reach. And then maybe Lugia also has that, but the inconsistencies taper off the power level for me a little bit even though the level is there um i also want to say that i think lugia was able to reach uh finals and juniors but not in masters because it just had to go through less games to get there mm -hmm. so there were less opportunities to brick <laughs> um but yeah so metagaming for juniors you want to look at what were the top players in juniors playing in the last format in the last tournament so like i said Lost Zone Box has been a comfort pick, and Lost Zone Box didn't get marginally worse. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's still good. It was good last format, it's good this format. So we knew that a lot of the top players, I think uh, Drake played Lost Zone Box, I want to say. Um, a, lot, a lot of the top juniors, if you're you know a parent that pays attention to junior standings, you'll recognize the names and see if they were playing Lost Zone Box. Then you can account for a couple top kids will just play the best deck. Like I said, they'll play Charizard. Um, then you have a couple of kids who play stall, but in the general pop, we were definitely expecting a good bit of Lugia, a good bit of Charizard. Uh, Lugia is easy to play and Charizard's easy to find a deck list for. Um, so really you just want to get into the mind of, okay, I'm a parent or a coach helping out uh, a nine, 10, 11 year old pick a deck and learn it. What are some of the first decks I'm going to go towards and then and work from the ground up there. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's a lot about the the very big surface level stuff, it seems like. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to get into the master stuff because a lot of things happened. Some of it seemed very obvious, right? We had Charizard showing up twice and winning the tournament in the top eight. That's like mm, most of us kind of expected something along those lines, right? But then we had two turbo hands in top eight. We had a Roaring Moon, Roaring Moon deck, which is not the same as... Uh, ancient box ancient at box, all yeah, yeah. it's a vastly different deck right so let's go ahead and start with we'll start with towards 60 specifically and then we should also kind of go into william acevedo's as well who got top four and if you did not watch that top four mirror match between Tord and william you should 100 percent go back and watch it i think it was very interesting and the way it ended is one of the most unsatisfying <laughs> endings to a pokemon trading card game i have ever seen but you know it is worth your 75 plus minutes to watch so Tord's list. Tord played Charizard. Charizard was said to be the BDIF. Can we take away anything from that deck selection before looking at the 60? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Like best deck, best player. Like it's you know it makes sense, right? Like the the deck's power level was accurately uh, depicted by the Japanese results that we've mm-hmm. all been going off of. Because like we we've been kind of you know if you're watching Omni Pokes videos and my videos in the weeks leading up to EUIC, you'll see we're doing these Japanese City League countdowns. We're looking at the uh, was wasn't Yokohama Fukuoma results. Um and you know, week after week we're saying, yo, Charizard Pidgeot's up here. We got Tina creeping up, we got Lawson Box creeping up, Lugia spiked as high finish at uh, Fukuoma, but Charizard is the best deck by all the metrics. And you know, Tord uh I'm sure collected that data as well. He made a very different deck list for it, but still took the archetype that everybody was defining as the best deck and showed why it was so i'm not surprised to see charizard win the event i'm also not surprised to see Tord pick charizard for this event let's look at the 60 because that has some interesting stuff in it that i think a lot of people are gonna i'm gonna assume at least run with so we have the two two Mm -hmm. pidgeot line but we also have the one one b barrel line and when we had Tord on as a little over a month ago for his i don't even know what to call that urshifu charizard deck he had said oh. both were good, and he's like, actually, I think both could be good in a Charizard deck, period. And clearly, he put his money where his mouth is, right, and included both of them. Yeah. Do you think this is something that people are going to take moving forward of running both Pidgeot and B-Barrel, or is it going to be like, eh, that space could be better used on, I don't know, more bosses orders or whatever people play? I mean, here's the thing. It, it counters or, like... It, it checks a lot of things all at once. Mm-hmm. So if you're against a deck that's going to run down your Pidgeot EX, well, you don't set up a second one. You set up the Bibberl instead. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're against a deck with Devos, it, it'll it Devo your Pidgeot, but maybe at the point of the game you're in, you don't need to waste another rare candy on putting it back down because you can just put your Bibberl back down that came back to your hand and then use your candy on Charizard and then keep your other candy uh as backup in case they're running another diva or something like that mm-hmm. um so yeah i mean I, i've been trying the list on ptcg live not really getting into those complicated sorts of board states <laughs> per se but it has been nice to know okay i can go aggressive here and go down to like three prizes or two prizes or one prize and um uh, because of my bibberol my opponent can't possibly disrupt everything and i'll be able to just close out the game next turn um, so it has felt like a nice little supplemental draw that makes sense. You know, you draw up to five and then you find the piece that you didn't draw into with your Pidgeot or if your opponent's playing Devos or your opponent's a lightning deck or, um, you know, the Bibberol can kind of check and balance all of those things. I tried a lot of, uh, B-Barrel, just straight B-Barrel before both for Vancouver regionals and moving into the post rotation. And what I was finding a lot is you're whiffing. You're whiffing a piece. Yeah, yeah. The Bibzard, I can't do it. I can't. I can't play just regular Bibzard. It feels like I'm nerfing the deck. So this feels like it is that best of both worlds, right? You're always going to hit yeah. the piece you need, but you also always have tools to work with, right? The Iono to two. You need a two card combo. Well, you're going to draw a few more cards, and then you're going to quick search for the plus one, right? So I really, really like this combo, and I think it's one that people should be. Considering strongly, if you're going to be playing Charizard in Orlando, which I don't know, it seems like still a good play to me. Would you agree with that statement? Or do you think like, eh, it just won maybe not the best play in the world? No, it's it's a good play. Like, in day two, will you hit people that are highly concentrated on beating you if you play Charizard? <laughs> yeah, you, you might. Like, you know, we saw... Um, was it Brayden uh, that played yeah. the S Path or EX deck? Yeah, the deck's uh, nuts. Still, still, still <laughs> lost to Charizard, right? Yeah. Like, um, Charizard can beat the counters. Uh, I believe Tord beat. I I want to say Tord beat Bert Walters Control. Correct. Um. Okay. Yeah. So like that's that's a counter. So Zard is good enough that it can beat the counters. You're going to have hard matchups, and if you don't play the deck well, those hard matchups will just probably result in losses for you. But um, the deck is at a power level, I think, that reminds me of things like Evil Tall Garbodor Mm -hmm. uh, back in like 2016 ish era, um, where even if there were counters floating around, it was still probably a good idea to just send the BDIF. So, um, I feel similar here with 
towards Zard. Um, yeah. Or, yeah. or just with Charizard in general, I feel that, yeah. Yeah, it's really, I mean, the power level, right? It's the early game. They can go pretty big, right? You're like, okay, you're only going to hit 180. It's like, yeah, but with a 330 HP Pokemon. And then late yeah. game, you're going to get Iono to two. And can you respond mm -hmm. to a 330 HP Pokemon off of an Iono to one or two? And that can be tough for a lot of decks to actually deal with. That just combination of early game, here's a big guy you can't deal with. And late game, here's a big guy you can't deal with. And I can actually utilize Iono, which a lot of decks in the format can't really utilize or roxanne we've also seen roxanne popping up in lists which is you know a pretty cool right. card yeah i mean charizard ex is just one of the most powerful cards ever printed if you just look at a pure numbers mm -hmm. and utility uh like to rate how strong the card is it like you said it has one of the highest hps in the game it has a weakness that's not super relevant at least it it just got a little more relevant but still not enough to make the card bad mm -hmm. um it has a very cheap attack cost and the attack scales as the game goes on and its ability self accelerates so um yeah there's really not much more they could have put on this card to like make sure that it was good so um uh, yeah again it just reminds me of those kinds of decks like um evil tall garbador is the one that keeps coming back to mind um even though the decks are very very different that deck even when there were counters around and even when we knew it would be the most played deck it was still one of the most popular choices amongst top players and it was still winning events so i think we'll see something like that with charizard although we do have a pretty interesting card pool and there are a lot of potential ways to try to go about countering it, especially countering it in the hands of people who aren't toured. Another thing in the list that I think is interesting, and I want to hear your take on whether this is moving forward or whether this was toward overtaking. We saw two Professor Turo scenarios plus a team Yell Cheer. And of course, the Yell Cheer cannot be eeried. And then the Turo lets you pick up anything against, for example, Block, Lax, or Mawile. Also occasionally get to pick up the Fish or the Rotom late game or whatever, right? But you don't really need two in a Yell Cheer for that. Do you think this is right. something that people should be running with moving forward? Or was this toward predicting stall? Beating one in top eight, so clearly it worked, right? You don't want to downplay yeah. that. But is this something like you should keep running with? Or did stall just like flop enough? That straight quad Snorlax stall flop just enough where it's like, eh, that's like a lot of spots for kind of mediocre utility. Yeah, so I, I don't think I ever thought that Snorlax stall was going to do well at this mm -hmm. event um, because it was just way too on the map. Um, so let me talk about the Tauros in a general sense. So when I am teching my own deck personally, I like to play cards that are going to be usable in pretty much every matchup or like in a general sense like it can help my deck's functionality and so the toro does lend that like you said it could pick up luminion or rotom um it could pick up maybe that second pidgey that you benched in case the first one was ko'd but now you don't need it anymore it could pick up the radzard that gets stuck in the active um it can even be used as a healing card so you tore as your charizard you super rod the energies back in and you evolve onto your charmeleon you had waiting on the bench and now you have a fresh charizard in the active with no damage and it's really easy to put those kinds of combos together with Pidgeotti X, uh, and especially even if you have the Bibberal set up as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really not a lot to ask to do something like quick search for Toro, Toro up, play the Super Rod, and then just soft evolve onto the Charmeleon without the rare candy, right? Yeah. So I do like Toro's overall functionality, and then it also gets you out of retreat locking scenarios where that is the main win con of your opponent's deck mm -hmm. um the idea behind two boss two toro and a yell cheer i believe that would probably be enough to beat most uh it, it would definitely be enough to beat all stall decks i believe mm -hmm. um because even if they have mimic you um if they're not playing lost city to get rid of your charmeleon um and you hold your vacuum for the defines vest your combustion will be doing 50 a time at the mimic you even if they play psychic energy they can't hit you because of the flare veil um if you aren't able to hold the vacuum because you know if you hold it too long it's just going to get airied away they will have the defines vest and you'll be chipping 10 at a time um but the other thing i'm thinking of is uh 
you are playing two super rods, so you could uh, just pile all of your energy onto a Radzard and use that to knock out the Mimic you if that's their only win con against you. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do think against stall and even maybe control decks that didn't know towards 60, uh, the four boss and four Turos over the course of a game thanks to cheer, and also playing Prime Catcher as your ace spec, which you probably want to use that ASAP if you ever find it in your hand because of Ari. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think between the, the double Toros, double boss, then cheer to make those four a piece, uh, it's going to beat a lot of control installs in game one, and then that's all you get to play. Um, so I think going into this weekend, maybe that won't work as well against control decks that are ready for the four gust and the four Turo. Mm -hmm. um, just completely give up on the retreat lock plan and just go for things like Mimic U or Clawfy X probably. And then do you have any thoughts between William and towards 60 so they are surprisingly yeah. different right now they do have some similarities it was one rotom one luminion so many people have been going to two rotoms and you know making ultra ball a consistency card is pretty good right they both played the mm -hmm. cleffa which we have not seen a ton of but it's got that grasping draw to drop to seven it's pretty darn good right it's that replacement for mysterious tail mew mysterious tail mew and then the big difference was the a specs you've already mentioned william was playing the maximum belt versus towards prime catcher and then the other big one was the two TM Devos from Williams list versus Tord running uh, Defiance Band as like the pseudo. Here's some sort of tool to do a thing. And in mirror match, that can hit 330 if something goes wrong, right? No one should be play themselves in that situation, but it happens. So do you have any thoughts between these two lists or any of those similarities? And you're like, this should just be standard moving forward. Uh, so... William went with the Ari plus double Devo, mm -hmm. and we saw that he still lost to Tord. So, um, I, I would like I'd... to point out though, yeah, <laughs> had that ahead. game three kept going, there is a zero percent chance Tord is pulling that game out from there. <laughs> like, down four yeah. candies, Charmeleon and prizes, and William's got the Pidgeot set up to KO the Radzard. Like, there is okay, so no chance. The There's no the, chance. That, that's why I think I like the Regieleki better than the Yelch here, potentially. Mm -hmm. Because if people are trying to go aggressive Ari Devo on you, then um, Regieleki can just get that candy back or something, and the opponent probably doesn't have a way to play another Ari. True. Um, so we saw like the Australians play Regieleki, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Some of the Americans, well, of, Cal Connor yeah, and Gabe a good, Smart. A good both. people came up with the Regieleki into um in their charizard list mm -hmm. to have that little bit of control aspect i guess um but cleffa yeah so cleffa is the counter to the counter because if your opponent puts down spear tomb turn one you can go okay i'll just buddy pop it for cleffa retreat and i'm going to draw this way this time now you have a spear tomb on your board for no reason mm -hmm. um i was actually considering cleffa in pidgeot control uh, because that would also give another good reason to play Poffin in the deck. Cause, <laughs> so you can either use Poffin and get double Pidgey, or you can use it to get Pidgey plus Cleffa. And if they play down the Spear Tomb, you can still draw. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the Cleffa is an answer to Spear Tomb, so it's nice for that. Um, but yeah, at the moment, I think, uh, like, I'm I'm thinking about, okay, if I play Charizard this weekend... I think I'm going to go with a more defensive build, and that's not necessarily to say I'm going to play towards 60 if I go with Zard, but um, I don't think I love the Devos and the Airy from William mm -hmm. after seeing that, like, you know, kind of more consistency and passiveness can also just get the job done. But at the same time, I think plenty of people will try to just cheese the matchup with Devos, which makes me think, okay, may maybe I want either, like, a second Charmeleon, or um, I want to play the um, the Regieleki instead of the Cheer, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to last format. I ended up switching off of Zard for Vancouver, which was a terrible, terrible, terrible choice. But I was finding the Devo was terrible into the two Flame Veil Charmeleons because you always mm -hmm. get one set up, right? And then any deck trying to do anything, which includes some of the control lists running Devo for the Pidgeot, but then also, you know, you're able to remove some of the Zards and able to remove their pressure and etc. The Double Flame Veil is so incredibly good. And I'm with you where I really like it right now. It's good into pretty much everything. And then it's also nice to keep that single prize board in those situations where, you know, Lost Tina, Lost Impacts, uh, what's it called? 
Pidgeot, and then you're like, well, I'm just going to keep these single prizes. I'm going to go in with the Radzard, and then I'm going to finish the game off from there. So I'm big, big, big fan of the double Charmeleon. Double Flame Veil specifically, <laughs> Charmeleon, the one that cannot be Devo and cannot be Sableyed. Yeah, I mean, it could be the other one as well, because, like, so if you evolve a Charizard on top of the... It doesn't matter which Charmeleon you evolve true. on top of. If you get Devoed, you could just put the Zard back down, right? That's true. Um, but the um, the other Charmeleon that hits 70 for two uh, is better against Mimikyu, you know? So, like, if you're trying to win the event and you expect to see control in the top eight and uh, you think they're going to be going with a Mimikyu strategy, then could be an idea to go with that but that's uh, yeah i think at the moment i plan on going with a more passive zard list meaning that i'm not currently planning to go with the devo route if i go with zard mm -hmm. but that's just like today's monday right yeah like we we just got we just got these results and have been mulling it over for like less than a day so um plenty of things can change Another deck that was in the top eight and one that we saw two of the top testing groups from North America bring. That was La Sontina. Now, it was piloted by Isaiah Bradner, who's one of the best players in the game, and at this point essentially is a Giratina, right? With the amount of times yeah. that both him and his group have been playing the deck. We saw the 2-1-1 Bennett line having both the Bennett EX as well as the something puppet, <laughs> which is essentially a VS Seeker if you La Son the baby Bennett, right? Yeah. What are your thoughts on the Lost Zone Tina specifically? Again, let's talk about the weird inclusion, which is the 211 Bennett line. Is this the secret spice from Bradner's group that is going to solve Tina? Okay, so Tina should have a bad matchup against Pal. So, like, theoretically, if you go first and you can bench a stop it and then turn to item lock, like, that could get you the dub versus Pal, mm -hmm. maybe. <laughs> um i don't know <laughs> i mean um we have seen people hype up the arctabax which yeah. is technically Somebody a very good answer to it. it yeah yeah um but like when i when i first saw bradner's list being played on stream i was like oh man i hope people net deck this because they're not going to play it well <laughs> um <laughs> um the so uh, the thing is i haven't been a tina fan i i didn't uh, Tina is not one of my current like decks that I want to mm -hmm. personally play. Um, I think it's fine. It has its favorite into Zard, so that's like a good reason to play it. Um, it still issues with some clunkiness, but uh, what I was telling you before we started recording was I think it's important to note that uh, for both Tord and Isaiah, like Tord, we could say is the best player in Europe, and Isaiah, the best player in North America, or at least they're both in the running. If not, mm -hmm. um, they could have very realistically made it to that point with a couple of card changes to their list, most likely. I yeah. think, like Isaiah with Tina and Tord with Zard, I wouldn't even say, oh wow, what kind of list are they playing? I would just accept that those players are with those archetypes in top eight, mm -hmm. right? So um, I could see them changing to completely different lists and still getting the same result over and over again. Um, so uh, I think I tend to go more towards the regular Tina that Azul's group brought. Um, but, you know, it, it, the Bennett stuff does some pretty cool things. Uh, the Bennett shouldn't have won the control matchup if Alessandro... No. Uh, play down one more item or one more trainer or something. Um, so that was kind of a fluke, but uh, it is what it is. So yeah, I'm not huge on the Bennett stuff in an already clunky deck. It made, it made them do things like drop down the one Poke Gear. Mm -hmm. um, the Ultra Ball inclusion made sense though, because you know now we don't even, we don't already we don't only have Tina. We also have the Bennett and the Bennett. Uh, it was definitely interesting. It was a nice surprise, uh, but I don't think it. Well, uh, I don't think it'll become the norm past like a bunch of people net decking it for Orlando. And then I think Tina lists after that might just go back to normal. I want to point out to the so you mentioned the like, OK, Tord won, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Any deck Tord could have. Well, that's not true. Any meta deck Tord could have won the tournament. Isaiah with Tina checks out because Isaiah is going to play Tina better than all of us will. But we can also extend that down to the top four, right? William Acevedo was the first one to win with Charizard and the one or part of the testing group that innovated Arvinzard back right. when the rest of us were playing 
for Iono and then Colris or Research. And then Alessandro Kermascoli, uh, shout out to iCatterpie. If you speak Italian, go watch uh, his YouTube and or Twitch channels. Or if you just want commentary that you don't understand with really good gameplay. But all right, hear me out on this one, right? Top four with uh, Pidgeot Snorlax. Let's go through mm-hmm. Alessandro's Limitless page after Worlds. So we have 37th at Lil, Pidgeot Control. Uh, LAIC, 32nd Pidgeot Control. Gdansk, 52nd Pidgeot Control. Stuttgart, 56th Pidgeot Control. Dortmund, 17th Pidgeot Control. Utrecht, 51st Pidgeot Control. <laughs> Into EUIC, third place with, shocker, Pidgeot Control. So it kind of goes off that exact same thing of every single person in this top four. It makes sense that they did well, and they did well with the deck that they did well with. Right? Yeah, yeah. So what are some of the conclusions then that should really be drawn from this top four for anyone who's looking at like the names, the lists kind of in combination with each other? Well, personally, the, the deck that I would most resonate with in that fashion would be last format Gardevoir. So I'm a little bummed that I can't just keep playing the same old deck. Uh, Gardevoir is still good, but it is a different deck. Um, Very different. Yes. Yeah, I think this goes with uh, what I say a lot about deck selection. You want a deck that is consistent in its functionality. You want a deck that is at least viable in its meta feasibility. And you want to know the matchup concepts better than anyone else in the room. Mm -hmm. Those are the three steps for selecting a deck. Functionality, feasibility, and matchup concepts. And uh, I am completely uh i'm 100 percent sure with saying this that Tord knows his matchup concepts isaiah knows his matchup <laughs> concepts william knows his matchup concepts and alessandro knows his matchup concepts uh and for the decks to get that far they had to have had at least neutral to above functionality and neutral to above meta feasibility mm-hmm. i think that is a very important lesson for everyone right so as we're looking at these lists and things like that it is all of the for sure top four and we can almost certainly put that even further down in this Mm -hmm. but everyone in that top four had a consistent solid deck and had consistent solid game plans that were a lot farther ahead than we might realize right a lot of people are oh charizard's just you rare candy zard and start swinging but that's not uh the least bit true is crazy (laughs) charizard mirror is crazy it's uh it's at the level of guard of our mirror last form I love the Charizard mirror. It's one of those where every time I lose, I'm like, oh, I can go back to turn two, turn three, you know, sometimes and be like, I should have passed. I shouldn't have even attacked. I should have, uh, you know, not evolved or, you know, there's like so many little things that makes it incredibly fun for me. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we did see two new decks come out of this, and these decks are both look, we're not supposed to do this, but I do this every time. They are the most North American decks I have seen. They are essentially oh, no. <laughs> look, they're going to come for me for saying that, not you. But these are the new version, the Maridon, the Roaring Moon, the what was that thing called? Curum V Max, the big turbo hitting stuff hard type decks. We saw two Iron Hand Valiants in top eight. And then we also saw one Roaring Moon, Roaring Moon deck with both the EX yeah. and the Baby Moon. So let's go ahead and start with this Future Hands deck. Everyone called it bad. Everyone said it was going to be highly played and it was going to flop. And it appears to have not flopped, at least for these two individuals. Future Hands. This is a deck with a... I mean, I'm, we're going to ignore the highest skill ceiling right now, but the skill floor seems pretty doable for a lot of oh, people. Yeah. So most people yeah. looking at this list might be like, hmm, I own Iron Hands. I'm capable of generating and using peak acceleration. Is this a deck that you think is going to start to become more popular heading into the Orlando Regional Championships? And will it continue to see the success yet again? I mean, it's just Peony Maridon. It's it's the same thing, in my opinion. Like, Maridon, the Maridon deck lost Flappy and Peony. So now this is just the new version of Go Fast with Iron Hands, and you can also deal some other kinds of damage. So I'm not surprised that somebody Mm -hmm. spiked with it, especially since... I think it was like around the ten percent mark in day one, maybe that like six right. to ten percent. Um, like it had a it had a nice chunk of people playing it, so it's not surprising that somebody spiked with it. Um, 
I think that and Lugia being the same percentage in the same tournament makes sense that that did well and Lugia didn't because Lugia's probably got farmed by all the hands mm -hmm. that they hit. Um, and Lugia is also inconsistent. So it had a very <laughs> bad matchup floating around and just times when it can brick and lose regardless of what it's against. Um, so yeah, hands will still be played. I don't think Zard players should be afraid of it though. Um, so yeah, like if you're playing Zard, it's not a deck you need to worry about. If it is a deck you need to worry about, maybe practice the matchup and see, you know, what your prize mapping needs to be. Uh, Do not cut your vacuum. Like, Important yeah, advice. Vacuum or like Beach Court to turn off the heavy baton mm -hmm. or Sino to turn off the gifts if they're still playing gifts. I actually forget on that part. Um, uh, Juho's not. And let's see about the other I one. I think they went nope. away from Mists to play Psychics now. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by TC Evolutions. TC Evolutions has the best damage counters, ability use markers, and now they have the best sleeves as well, featuring the dual spec sleeves. You can use code LAKE10 for 10% off sleeves, damage counters, ability use markers, status condition markers, anything. Be sure to check out tcevolutions.com and use code LAKE10 for 10% off. Anyway, let's get back to the show. Uh, Iron Bundle can be very good against that deck in the early game mm. because they'll typically only have their their one single prizer will be Maridon because they needed to use their radars to get crowns and hands mm -hmm. on the bench. So Bundle can force them to send up a two prizer um, in which matchups or which decks you want to put Bundle. I'm not too sure outside of Lost Zone decks and Chi and Pal. Those seem to be the best place to play Bundle. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, the deck isn't like a problem or anything. It's it's a high roll aggro deck. Every card game has one of those. Um, and there's some decks that it's just going to innately have a problem against, and there's some decks that it will innately roll over. So um, it's just a necessary evil in the format like Peony Maridon was, and I'm just going to ignore it personally. So a couple things that I've noticed with the deck, and this is part of because I've been playing a lot on live, and that is live players do love that deck. Uh, mm. You should know. Iron Hands can amp you very much for 220 damage, potentially. So, A, make sure to pay attention to their bench. But that's something that you definitely have to be very well aware of, right? If they can do a lot of damage, they can do it out of nowhere, too, right? With double radar plus the Ancient Booster, Future Booster Capsule. And then the other one is they are pretty reliant on Counter Catcher. And this goes back to that bundle, right? Where yeah. they want you to take one prize, so you're always one prize ahead. So they can always Counter Catcher to eventually set up that, like, winning the game right so yeah the next one of the biggest things in this format and like like uh there's so much skill expression at so many different levels right now in the game which is really great um but it might also be frustrating for like maybe lesser experienced players or newer players that are confused on why they're losing sometimes but essentially if you take the first prize card and it's a single and then your opponent responds by taking a double mm -hmm. and now the prize difference is five prizes to four prizes the person at four prizes has just taken advantage in tempo and like if they just never stop taking prizes they win the game and so mm -hmm. uh the decks that are best at doing that right now i think are uh moon dunsparce and maybe future hands mm -hmm. like they're very very good at uh just prize trading consistently and not caring about anything else like your opponent can have a 20 card hand if they want but if you're winning the prize trade you're going to keep winning the prize trade let's go ahead and talk about that uh roaring moon roaring moon slash da dunsbar stack uh this is one that i have been playing a lot online and i think this deck is incredibly fun <laughs> if nothing yeah. else and it's definitely incredibly powerful so this to me seems like the way to play ancient box now we did say uh vinnie and joao get pretty good results with a more traditional ancient box list but this one it's got the moony x it's got just straight consistency of four ofs it's got those dun sparses which is both a pivot and a way to draw cards and a way to be iono proof in the late game like it's got so many different things this deck also screams to me again i'm gonna say it this is north american deck i think this is the deck that people like myself i would strongly be considering this deck right now just based off of playing probably a dozen games and being like I mostly get this. I could master this in the next couple of days and do incredibly well. Cause like you said, it sets the tempo. This is the deck that says, here you go. I'm going to smack you in the face, smack you in the face, smack you in the face. Sometimes with single prizes, I'm going to Oko you. Can you respond? And sometimes the deck says, no, <laughs> I cannot respond to this much pressure this quickly. So Roaring Moon, is this a deck that you think is going to see again an uptick in play? And is it going to see success yet again? 
I really, really like this deck. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a lot of people have been surprised that I've been saying that because I typically go towards the more convoluted decks. Yeah. Like, I liked Guardi for a long time. Um, before that, I liked Arceus and Teleon. <laughs> um like so a, co a couple of the decks that i've been known for in the past couple of years are typically very convoluted i i try to stay away from the big turbo unga mm -hmm. decks that uh don't let don't let me set the pace for the game or don't let me make decisions that end up uh deciding how the game ends but uh the dunsparce with roaring moon uh is very very all around i feel because there are a lot of sequencing decisions that you're going to make that are going to be the difference of, you know, that extra one card you draw or um, the ordering in which you pop your Dedun Sparses or knowing when to save them for next turn or mm -hmm. um, knowing when to present a fully single prize board. Um, and a lot of resource management. So although the deck is pretty simple in what it's doing at the end of every turn i'm just going to be trying to swing for some raw damage in the active and hoping that i've gotten to the threshold that i need mm -hmm. to um it's kind of like loss in box in that regard like with loss in box even if you just spit something for 110 like a lot of time you're you are progressing your game plan because you can clean that up later yeah um so i i like moon the dunsparce a whole lot um i think it's like if anybody is just wants to get day two, I think you just grind that deck and get your day two. Um, the thing I will say is um, there are a lot of times in the Zard matchup where you will swing at a Zard and then clean it up later and do things like that. And that gets a lot worse with Tauros mm -hmm. uh, being so commonplace in Zard now. Um, but on the flip side, Tord and william both omitted mist energy from their lists so that that is that uh, kind of like the toros hurt the moon deck but then the lack of mist energy helps the moon deck mm -hmm. um i'd probably still play one sino because plenty of people are gonna play mist energy still uh but yeah i really really like the moon deck i'm not surprised that it got a top eight because it's a consistent deck it's one of the best at prize trading i've found um and it yeah so it and it doesn't you're you're able to present a board without liabilities a lot of times i think i've said this on the podcast before and i'm going to say it again every time a deck reminds me of it it gives me vibes of that original picaron deck in that Ooh. you have your big guy who takes big swings but that wasn't the core of the deck right and yeah. that original picaron deck and this goes way back to when team up dropped luke i know you were playing back yeah. then but listeners you might not have been playing then you just think of the pandemic picaron which is very different you swung yeah, with the Zapdos. Off. Yeah, you swung with the Zapdos and occasionally the Jolteon uh, GX a lot. And you could go entire games where your opponent didn't know that you were even a Picarom deck until late. And you would kind of do this whole combo of Coco Prism, Thunder Mountain attack by dropping a Picarom. And it's the same with the Roaring Moon. You can sit there with your babies. You can start swinging, hitting stuff a little bit here and there, and suddenly drop this big guy and do a bunch of stuff. Now, of course, the difference is the Drachi from Team Up is now uh to dunsparce which is significantly right. worse but it gives me that Anyways. exact vibe of like you can go play the single prize game start poking hitting taking easy ko's drop a big guy out of nowhere and do a ton in which case is instant knockout instead of a ton of damage and to me that's like ooh, that's so good i'm a big fan of that type of deck <laughs> yeah i'll add on to that comparison and say that Jirachi probably wouldn't have been good without a skateboard. True. And uh, this deck wouldn't be good if Dunsparce didn't have free retreat. Yeah, there is another Dunsparce. I ran into someone on Live Ladder playing it, and it seemed cool at first, right? Because it lets you find a friend, search your deck for a card or a Pokemon, yeah. and they could grab the Dunsparce for the next turn. I was like, that's kind of cool, but it's not cool because <laughs> this deck yeah, doesn't have free retreat. Really I have that in my pivot. physical build of the deck just because I somehow only pulled two Dunsparces. But... <laughs> um yeah that, it's just a proxy don't worry <laughs> if you say so when we see you rolling up with roaring moon with the wrong i'm not gonna find a friend i promise i will not be finding a friend um was oh, there anything else that you can take away from top eight before we talk about at least i have two decks from top 32 that i think people need to be aware of and 
I, it's probably too late to consider them, honestly, but I'm still going to hype them up regardless. But did you have any other things, thoughts from top eight? We did kind of ignore control, uh, which we can always talk more about. And by we, I mean you, because I have not played a single game Pidgeot control this format. OK, yeah. Pidgeot control is what I've spent the most time on in this format, mm -hmm. um, because, like I said, Guardy left. And so I was like, well, what can I have the most control over my games with if Guardy is no longer here? Yeah. Um, and honestly, Roaring Moon almost satisfies that for me because of, um, you know, with Guardy, uh, prize trading was like at the base level, Guardy was very good at prize trading, but there was so much more happening. Um, so Moon Dunsparce almost feels like a very simplified version of what Guardy could do with the fully single prize board mm -hmm. and, you know, control when there's a two prizer on the board. Less so with Moon removing the two prizer from board, like Guardy was forced to because you have to use the Psychic Embrace and then remove it. But um, more in the fact that you can have a board of like four Dunsparce and two Baby Moon and then you just, you know, hold, you wait to put down the big one. Um, so just a little side tangent on moon but yeah yeah so pidgeot control is very good be for reasons i was mentioning why i had one of my juniors play it um it's a deck that nobody's practicing against now maybe they have a little bit of information about it because they watched a stream and you know alessandra was on stream but i'd gather that most people aren't able to follow what's happening just from watching one isolated game of control um, because it's not a deck that does the same thing every time. You know, if you watch M Moon, if you watch uh, Pidgeot Charizard, if you watch uh, Lost Zone Giratina, they're going to do a lot of the same things game after game. But mm -hmm. with Control, you could play five <clears throat> five different decks against Control, and then on the sixth deck, they bring out Cloppy X, or they bring out <laughs> Bufalon. And this is a card that you didn't even know was in the deck, because it, there's so it's so much of a toolbox, but also so much just about controlling whether or not your opponent can win the game so i really like control in a closed deck list environment also in a very major tournament um the thing bad about control is that you can hit a deck like lugia and uh personally at the moment if i play control i think i'm just going to flat out take the loss to lugia because i don't think it should see a lot of play and i also think that if i can get like four wins i will be away from most of the lugias <laughs> um and i'm so i'm it also comes down to your goals right I, and i think this is something very very important my goal is not to day two and then whatever happens happens my goal is i'm looking for a top eight mm -hmm. and so i would rather have a better chance at top eighting and play a deck that could just falter to like three bad matchups in day one than take a safe pick that i'm not going to be able to beat the best players on the best decks with in day two that's always a really good piece of advice and i want to throw uh, I got that advice from multiple top players going before last NAIC. I was on Guardi and I was kind of like, I'm playing this fine, but I don't think I'm playing it that well. And then, like I said, two very, very high tier players were both like, yeah, I think you should consider something like Arctina where you're able to do that. And it was a heckin' good choice. I did terribly with it because the uh, arctina stuff right but i really stand by that choice and it kind of made me realize hearing from two very good players of like i can play a deck well enough to maybe day two and then completely get bodied <laughs> by the competent players and that was not my goal right if it is your goal right. then you are very different than what both of us are talking about right now which is like i wanted to do well so it's like well at a certain point i'm gonna have to judge path in order to get that advantage yeah. against the Tords and the Henrys and the, you know, everyone else in the room. Yeah, and that's kind of my problem with the Moon Sparse is that um, I'm very confident I could just stop thinking about deck choice today, play the Moon deck that I already have built. I don't want to make any changes to it, and I'm very confident that I can get into day two. But once I'm into day two, I am going to be crossing my fingers that I don't hit somebody who's good at Charizard. Because... Um, once that happens, I feel like I'm just going to get stalemated out of winning a game. Yeah. You know, like, because they, like I said, if I ever have to poke a Zard, they will probably be able to make the Toro play happen. And then, uh, you know, that's one poke that I lose. And that's one turn of efficient damage that I'm now losing the prize trade when my deck was supposed to be good at prize trading. Um, 
still very possible. Mm -hmm. I I don't want to exaggerate how bad that matchup is against a good Zard player. It's probably like 40, 60 because you can still spike high power level cards. Mm -hmm. You can get counter catcher at the right time. You can get prime catcher at the right time and maybe have like ultra ball to accelerate the amount of ancient cards in your loss zone and you can pick off a luminion or pick off a rotom and you get ahead in the prize trade and then if they're not playing mist energy you'll always win out from there because mm -hmm. you go frenzy gouging frenzy gouging um but uh that's definitely a reason that keeps me away from that choice and pushes me more towards something like pidgeot control where i know i know this deck better than my opponent knows this deck right um Whereas like Zard, I think Zard should be a choice on everybody's radar mm -hmm. because it's the best deck in format. Mm -hmm. But again, I never entered a tournament with Charizard. Um, I, I played strictly Guardi um, for the last set. And I, I've only been to three majors this tournament. So it's not like I've played a ridiculous amount of majors, but mm -hmm. I played Guardi for two and Lost in Box for one. Um, so going into this tournament i know i'm a good player but there's a lot of people who have been maining charizard like the william azevedo's the the towards um uh the ian robs so like i'm uh the, the azuls you know he could yeah. always go back to charizard so like i am definitely wary of picking up charizard and taking it to my first major and wanting to top eight this major but I'm going to have to fight through people who have way more time on Charizard than I do and potentially have, you know, tricks up their sleeves that I haven't begun to understand yet because I am, I'd say I'm advanced at Charizard, but I'm not top 1% at Charizard. So it's definitely keeping me away from uh, wanting to submit the deck, even though it is the BDIF. And for anyone saying, hmm, would that really happen to me? Portland, I lost out on $1,000 because that exact thing happened to me <laughs> where I hit a Charizard player on the winning in for 32 who uh, had played the mirror match a the whole lot. Better. Yeah, I know afterwards we talked about it and he's like, I watched the Grant Manley video. I grinded this matchup a whole lot. And I was like, I played two in day one and that was my practice, yeah. right? And it was, yeah, yeah. Was absolute steamroll. So it does happen. I also want to put out something for the moon deck that you mentioned. This is both playing it and playing against it, right? Even if you want to theory out oh if they turro i can still win the big thing mm -hmm. there is the resources with that deck right you have four dark patch you have four sada and otherwise mm -hmm. you don't have any other energy acceleration so the big thing there is not just like oh no i can still win if they do the thing the charizard matchup and a lot of matchups that have hand disruption really come down to can you conserve resources properly to chain attackers because that has been yeah. one of my biggest problems against people who know what they're doing or at least do the right thing even if they don't know that it's correct is I, right. I need my dark patches i need my sodas or else this set can miss a turn it's not an automatic attach double turbo attack you know every single turn right, right? right. Uh, i just want to go something real quick i'll say that's yeah. off topic because of what you said you know uh do they do they know how to play the matchup or in other words do they do the right thing that time mm -hmm. um I hear, you know, a lot of throwing around of good player, quote unquote, like, is, oh, that's a good player. Well, yeah. like, it, it matters more how precise you are in an isolated event than, like, how good, like, the community thinks you are. Mm -hmm. Because, like, a good player can still misplay in a tournament, and a player who hasn't been established as good yet can be very precise over the course of an event. Or even just stumble into making the right plays like you had just alluded mm -hmm. to. Yeah. So like just a just a confidence thing. Like a lot of players are saying, Oh, I don't know if I could beat good players. Well, it matters how precise you are at this event. So if you put in the practice and become very precise with a deck, then you should be considering yourself a good player if you're going to understand your matchup concepts and replicate them in tournament as you would in practice. So before we end up, we'll be ending a little bit, but there's two decks that I just wanted to mention in top 32. One, because it's my pet deck, and the other one, I think people should be aware of its existence heading into Orlando. So the one that I want to mention because it's my pet deck is Braden Elford's Expathra, Expathra Zatu deck. Now, of course, there's also a Bennett in there, and you really can't ignore the Bennett. The Bennett makes the deck not a complete pile. And I want to mention this deck because I've seen people on Twitter, a lot of people on Twitter say this deck beats Charizard and nothing else. And you alluded to this earlier. This deck actually has a pretty close Charizard matchup, but does in fact <laughs> beat many other things. This deck is not a beat Charizard, nothing else. Charizard's it's like a 55-45. It's actually super close. Yeah, you're a little favored against Charizard. You'll probably farm people in day one that get scared because you have a grass attacker, but yeah. like 
once you get into day two, people are going to be like, they'll have an idea of what they need to do to beat you, right? Even though it's a deck that's built to beat you. Oh, yeah. And there's also just the you are less consistent than them is also incredible. Absolutely. Important. That always goes into rogue decks. It's like, OK, I on paper, I should like, OK, great example. Mm -hmm. Bibzard on paper should be a fantastic play. Heck yeah. For this upcoming weekend. It, and I almost think that Moonsparce does what you want Bibzard to do is something I meant to say. Ooh, that's good. Um, but yeah, on, on paper, Bibzard should be fantastic, right? Because you have all single prizers. Heck, you could even bench like a Spirit Tomb to counter the people using Rotom and Luminion. Your board is just a big Zard in the active and then single prizers. Mm -hmm. So matchup conceptually you sh bibs art should be great and that's what something happens when you have a rogue deck like as path or ex or maybe you have another rogue deck out there listening um but you have to remember just because on matchup spreads this deck is favored you have to take into account i'm playing an unoptimized unresearched rogue deck this hasn't been played into oblivion and found the optimal 60 or maybe you have but still if it's a rogue deck, there's probably a reason why it's rogue and not mainstream. Either, uh, either you cracked the meta or you have a deck that's slightly inconsistent but has uh, unique strategies. And that's what I think comes into play here, is that you have a unique deck that has unique strategies. It's probably going to suffer in consistency and reliability, so you're not always going to be able to exact those strategies in the way that you want to. As we saw on stream, for anyone who watched, mm -hmm. I believe it was William against Braden in the Charizard versus Espathra matchup. But there's a few cool things for anyone out there who is playing Espathra. Highly recommend you check out this list. Or if you want a rogue deck, though, I will say this takes a lot of practice, actually, <laughs> to uh, get the sequencing resources, most importantly, bench management down. This is one of those decks that like it's very tier three. <laughs> and so you have to play it incredibly well to get carried right. in there. But uh, it's got some really cool stuff. I'd highly recommend you take a look at it if you are interested in that deck because the Banette solves a lot of matchups that you otherwise wouldn't have expected, right? It's either early into Qian Pao or late into Qian Pao if they're too loose with their energies. Uh, Law Zone stuff between the Flutter Main and the Banette feels very good. The Aspathra plus the Pokemon League Headquarters into Hands decks and Moon decks is also incredibly powerful. And of course, Aspathra is good into most things outside of lugia and guardi uh are not able to accelerate an extra energy every single time and deal with 260 hp so i think this is a deck that again it's because of my pet deck i think this is going to establish itself as a borderline meta deck i'm not going to say meta but it's going to be like yeah this deck technically exists and should be known about by the time we reach la oh, yeah. regionals there's plenty of decks like that that are like i know what it is like um like so example my mom is going to play in orlando but mm -hmm. uh pokemon is not even like number five on her priority list <laughs> right now so like she knows the tier one deck she knows the tier two deck she knows the deck she's playing but she'll come up against a deck on ladder and say oh what the heck is this pokemon and i'll be like oh didn't you know that's uh that's the dialga v star metang deck or that's the <laughs> Espa that's the espathra like i've been you know i've looked at 120 pages of city league results in the past four weeks so i know about these decks um so yeah it's a good idea to know what the cards do and what decks are out mm -hmm. there even if you're not going to hit them the next deck that i wanted to mention and this one because it was an arceus deck and again What's more North American than Arceus? Nothing. I don't really know what. Yeah, this was in top 32. We had Fabricio playing Arceus B-Barrel. OK, nothing surprising there. But the interesting part was we had a Luxray V. Mm -hmm. We had a Flutter Main. And then the supporter line featuring three Eeries. <laughs> we played Hero Cape as our ace spec. We had three Grabbers as well. This deck is the new dte handlock mew question mark i don't know what entire what to call it specifically but it is here's my arceus here's my easy to set up pokemon and here's a ton of disruption eeries ionos hero cape sharon's care there's a roseanne's backup to reuse the hero's cape i i can't and promise you i get behind that and the devo correct you, yeah you can technically devo three times because you have uh roseanne's and you have pal pad which is 100 percent right that's no way this deck beats Chien pal without <laughs> trying to devo spam as a well, it can because of the luxury v right you can grab the uh, their candies out of the hand with that 
Oh, that's and you true. You can also too. arry the candies away. So, like, you can arry and hit a candy, but see an Irida, and then retreat into Luxray and get the Irida out. So and then your opponent draws passes. This Arceus Handlock deck is one that I am just in love with at first glance, and I think it I is... I wouldn't touch it with a 12-foot pole. <laughs> Um, and I'm also not going to care the least amount about this deck because one, I probably won't play against one True. Uh, a deck that looks anything like this. And if I do, like, I feel like it's a coin flip that they're going to brick. Like, they're going to pass, like, Badoof Pass or something. Like, they'll have a Badoof and a Radiant Gardevoir in the board, and, like, they'll attach a Psychic Energy to Radiant Gardevoir because that might not have to be their attacker. Like, I can see that happening for sure. As someone who got donked multiple times in Vancouver playing Arceus... Yeah, that's true. Anytime your opponent's playing like, Arceus. The last time I hit Arceus at a major was either Charlotte or Knoxville, and I was playing Gardevoir. And I game one, I just remember that I beat them by countercatching their Bibberol, and they they didn't draw into a DTE or a switch. And so then I started picking things off with Screamtail. Like, that's just what I think about Arceus piles. It's like th this could lose to Boss their Bibberol and like give them some time. <laughs> I love this deck. If you are an Arceus diehard and or a pokey parent without a ton of time who wants an Arceus yeah, deck for the format, I would 100% be checking this one out because at the very least, it looks heckin' fun. Luxury V is one of my favorite cards. And uh, Pidgeot Control is a little too big brain sometimes. I will fully admit that. So this yeah, is... Yeah, if you want to do cool things and, like, you know, frustrate your opponent, make them read a couple of cards, like, you're probably not going to win the event with this, but you oh, will no. get to do some cool things. So yeah, I love this deck. Highly recommend everyone at least look at it if you're looking for something along those lines. Luke, you've said a ton of stuff already in this general vein, but do you have any other thoughts from EUIC heading into Orlando or other advice for people heading into Orlando regionals from someone who I didn't mention this at the beginning. I should have. Uh, I asked you to do this because I think you're one of the best, like both metagamers and people at figuring out what to do with the information. I'm great at figuring out what a metagame is going to be, and I have no freaking clue what to do with that information. So you fill in right. the gaps that I am completely lacking. So do you have any other thoughts or advice for people? Yeah, um, I mean, so Limitless at the time of recording, this doesn't have the full day two standings. PTCGStats.com has a little bit more of it filled out. Um, and you can just look like, uh, uh Brett, Brent Tonneson said this on, I think your, was he on your podcast last week? Heck yeah. Okay. So Brent said, like, I believe it was him who said, like, let look at the top 12 decks. You can mm -hmm. probably pick one of those and you'll do well with it if it's the deck that you know how to play. Yeah, that was Brent. Um, and yeah, and so like there's really not much more to say than that. Like we see uh, <laughs> uh Arceus Armor Rouge deck at 16th <laughs> place. Um Fabian got ninth with Guard of Rex. He had a top eight record, but bubbled, mm -hmm. I believe. Correct. Um we got Pedro with Lost Zone Box. Uh we have Azul with a more vanilla type of Giratina V Star. Um, multiple Roaring Moons. We have Chi and Pal in the top 32. We got that as Path that you mentioned. We got Lugia in top 32. Um, so you don't know how many Lugia bots messaged me and were like, uh, you know, I, I'm worried about Lugia. I thought it would do better at EUIC. Like, it got top 32 out of 2,500 players and won $2,000 or something. Yeah. I think Lugia did pretty well, and you should still play it if it's your deck. Yeah. Um, at this so, like, don't get scared by the results. At this level, in terms of the number of rounds and the people who are there and the size, anything in top 32 or above, I would say is, and that's why we look at that Arceus deck, is definitely something that <laughs> could be considered viable. Except for the Arceus deck. <laughs> play Arceus Armor Rouge or play Arceus Tina or something at that point, I think, if you're looking for a good placement. Like we said, if you want to do cool stuff, frustrate the opponent, make people read some cards, like pull off some sick combos, then sure, do whatever the heck you want. But if your goal is day two, like I said, you want functionality, feasibility, and matchup concepts. If your goal is winning the event, you need to know how to beat the best players playing Zard. Luke, where can the people find you? And do you have any good YouTube videos coming out before Orlando that people should check out? Yeah, I just told my editor yesterday that I have to remember I have a YouTube channel because I've spent the past week just like testing and coaching. Oh. So you're busy being a player instead? That's fine. Get a good result yeah. and the subs will come back. <laughs> right, right. Um, no, I, I should have at least one helpful video before I leave for Orlando. At least one. Um, 
but I think we talked about so much good stuff here today. Like this is worth a, a listen and then maybe even a re-listen. Um, you could find me on Twitter at Celio's underscore network or YouTube at Celio's network. And that's pretty much all you need to know about me. Myself, Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube at Miller underscore Magikarp. Follow at Lake of Rage Pod on Twitter as well. Uh, rate and review the show. Check out our sponsors, TC Evolutions, uh, Tabletop Village, Doomed Gaming, and the Champions Reserve. This has been another episode of the Lake of Rage podcast. We'll catch you all next week. Are you looking for temporal forces or do you want to go shiny hunting with some Paldean fates? Well, be sure to check out tabletopvillage.com and use code MELLOW5 to get 5% off your order for temporal forces, Paldean fates, or any other product, sleeve, etc. that you are looking for. Not only does it support the podcast and you get some good cards, but you are helping out a family-owned Pokemon first business as well. Again, tabletopvillage.com, code MELLOW and the number 5, M-E-L-L-O-W, and the number 5. Anyway, back to the show.